One of the most common of these traps is a sense of meaninglessness. From our new view of reality, we are free from the egoic desire to find meaning. We see that the ego's desire to find meaning in life is actually a substitute for the perception of being life itself. The search for meaning in life is a surrogate for the knowledge that we are life. Only someone who is disconnected from life itself will seek meaning. Only someone disconnected from life will look for purpose. That's a teaching meant to shake us from our slumber. In order to come into our full potential and to embody the truth and radiance of what we are, we must come vitally alive, we must lean once again into presence. We must pour ourselves forth into life, instead of trying to escape life and avoid its challenges. Enlightenment depends to a large extent on believing that you are born for freedom in this lifetime, and that it is available now, in this moment. The mind, which creates the past and future, keeps you out of the moment where the truth of your being can be discovered. In this moment, there is always freedom and there is always peace. This moment in which you experience stillness is every moment. Don't let the mind seduce you into the past or future. Stay in the moment and dare to consider that you can be free now. Do not seek after what you yearn for, seek the source of the yearning itself. This calling can arrive at any point in your life. It is that moment when the trajectory of your life begins to turn toward the mystery of life. When I say the mystery of life, what I'm referring to is that transcendent aspect of life that shines through the world of space and time. Looking at personal issues is like pulling just the top of the weeds out of your lawn, they pop right back up. You may have some relief from the trouble of the day, but the root is still there, totally untouched. But having experiences, even if they clear up problems or offer beautiful insights, is very different than finding the root of who you are. If you don't get to the root, you just get another weed, in a true awakening, it is realized very clearly that even the awakening itself is not personal. It is universal spirit or universal consciousness that wakes up to itself. Rather than the me waking up, what we are wakes up from the me. What we are wakes up from the seeker. What we are wakes up from the seeking. This is what occurs at the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark, when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus in the river of Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Gospel of Mark chapter 1 verse 10 When you awaken, when Spirit descends, the veil of your dream state is torn apart, and all of a sudden you're awakened to a new reality. In awakening, what's revealed to us is that we are not a thing, nor a person, nor even an entity. What we are is that which manifests as all things, as all experiences, as all personalities. We are that which dreams the whole world into existence. Spiritual awakening reveals that that which is unspeakable is actually what we are. The truth loves. It does not judge. It holds a big sword in its hands and can ruthlessly discern what is false and what is true, but it does not hold grudges. If you are not telling the truth to yourself, you will suffer. If it was not ruthless, there would be no learning. Truth doesn't spoon feed you. At some point after awakening, sometimes very soon, sometimes not for quite a while, you reach a stage that I call trials and tribulations. In the Jesus story, this is symbolized by Jesus' 40 days in the desert and his encounter with Satan in the desert immediately following his baptism. In Buddhism, this stage is mythically portrayed by the image of Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree, assaulted by Maya, the force of illusion. Maya is an impersonal force of illusion. While Satan is a personification of what we think of as evil, but the source of evil is actually illusion, so these are really two different mythic representations of the same experience. The Buddha image shows us abiding tranquility amidst the turning wheel of life. Close the gap between what is and what you want it to be, between what is presenting itself and what you want to present itself. This gap of judgment is the separation you feel. You need to totally choose what is and lean into it with your whole being. What is the cause of suffering in the human being? Why is it that human beings have such a difficult time putting their suffering down? What's the reason that we often carry it around? When it becomes such a burden to us, one of the primary reasons we suffer is because we believe what we think, that the thoughts in our heads come uninvited into our consciousness, swirl around, and we attach to them. We identify with them and grab hold of them. 
We should come to know that there is more reality and sacredness in a blade of grass than in all of our thoughts and ideas about reality. The primary task of any good spiritual teaching is not to answer your questions, but to question your answers. For it is your conscious and unconscious assumptions and beliefs that distort your perception and cause you to see separation and division where there is actually only unity and completeness. It's easy to use meditative techniques to suppress our human experiences, to suppress things that we don't want to feel. But what is called for is just the opposite. True meditation is the space in which everything is revealed, everything is seen, everything is experienced. In order to find what the concept of God is pointing to, you must let go of your image of God and every concept you have about God. You must dare to be void of all concepts and enter into perfect emptiness, perfect stillness, and perfect silence. You must forget everything you have ever learned about God. It won't help you. It may comfort you, but such comfort is imaginary, it is an illusion. Let go of all the false comforts of the mind. Let them all come to an end. The end must be experienced full in stillness. When you let all images, all concepts, all hopes, and all beliefs end, stillness is experienced. Experience the core of stillness. Dive into it and surrender fully. In full surrender to stillness, you directly experience that to which the concept of God points. In that direct experience, you awaken from the dream of the mind and realize that the concept of God points to who you truly are, happen, and it's not uncommon for them to happen for some people. What people usually see, if their experiences are real, is what needs to be seen, what needs to be freed. As one great Buddhist abbess said to me, you usually don't have a past life that shows you what a sterling example of enlightenment you were, because enlightenment leaves no trace, it is like a fire that burns clean. There's no karmic imprint it leaves behind. She said if you have any past lives, you're probably going to see what a great a jackass you were, which I loved, and which has corresponded to my experience. I didn't necessarily always see what a great a jackass I was, although in some cases, I saw that I was a lot more than a great a jackass. Most of the past lives I saw were moments of confusion. Moments of unresolved karmic conflict. Unfortunately, when we turn to religion, often the churches box us in even more. They tell us that we are inherently flawed, that we need to be forgiven for this sin, this stain that we carry. The first and most important function of religion is to connect you with the mystery of life and the mystery of your own being. When religion fails to do this, it has betrayed its primary mission and all we are left with is dogma and belief. Jesus said, I have cast fire upon the world, and see, I am guarding it until it blazes. Gospel of Thomas, but Jesus never defines what someone must have faith in, he doesn't say your faith in me has healed you. Rather, it's faith itself, the trust in things unseen that heals. Being is that which disturbs our insistence on remaining in the life-numbing realm of our secret desperation. It is the itch that cannot be scratched, the whisper that will not be denied. To be, to truly be, is not a given. Most of us live in a state where our being has long ago been exiled to the shadow realm of our silent anguish. At times being will break through the fabric of our unconsciousness to remind us that we are not living the life we could be living. The life that truly matters. At other times being will recede into the background silently waiting for our devoted attention. But make no mistake, being, your being, is the central issue of life. To remain unconscious of being is to be trapped within an ego-driven wasteland of conflict, strife, and fear that only seems customary because we have been brainwashed into a state of suspended disbelief where a shocking amount of hate, dishonesty, ignorance, and greed are viewed as normal and sane. But they are not sane, not even close to being sane. In fact, nothing could be less sane and unreal than what we human beings call reality. So with awakening, the stakes go up. The more awake we get, the higher the stakes get. I remember when I was staying at a Buddhist monastery for a while. The abbess there, a wonderful woman, talked about this process of awakening as climbing a ladder. With each step you go, you have less and less tendency to look down. You have less tendency to act in ways you know aren't true or to speak in ways you know aren't true or do things you know aren't coming from truth. You start to realize that the consequences have become greater, the more awake we get, the greater the consequences are. Finally, the consequences of acting outside of truth become immense, the slightest action or behavior that's not in accordance with the truth can be unbearable to us, 
we become trapped in a world of dreams, a world in which we live primarily in our minds. Spiritual autonomy is knowing who and what you are, knowing that you are divine being itself, knowing that the essence of you is divinity. You are moving in the world of time and space, appearing as a human being, but nonetheless you are eternal, divine being, the timeless breaking through and operating within the world of time. To Jesus, spirit is everything. Nothing matters more than spirit or, as I like to say, divine being. Divine being is what Jesus is here for, it is the vitality source from which he moves, from which he speaks, from which his critique arises. He is the living presence of divine being. He's a human being too, but he's here to convey divine being, and that comes out most clearly in the Gospel of Mark. This Gospel uniquely conveys Jesus' search for himself. Mark's Jesus is a Jesus who is very much a searcher, he's looking for his identity, he's looking for his role, he's experimenting, he's finding out what works and what doesn't. He's on a journey, and he's inviting all of us along for that journey with him as if we were also the disciples. In true meditation, we're in the body as a means to transcend it. It is paradoxical that the greatest doorway to the transcendence of form is through form itself. And so, when you sit down to meditate, connect with your senses, connect with how you feel, what you hear, what you sense, what you smell. Your senses actually anchor you in the moment. When your mind wanders, anchor yourself in your senses. Start to listen. What are the sounds outside? Start to feel. How do you feel in your body? Enter into the felt sense, the kinesthetic sense of your being. Connect not only with what you feel in your body, but also with what you sense in the room. Start to smell. As you are sitting, what does it smell like? Through your senses, open to the whole world within and around you. This grounds you in a deeper reality than your mind, and it also helps focus you in a place other than your mind. Allowing everything to be is extraordinarily simple, but it's not as easy as people imagine. If you're actually doing it correctly, you'll find yourself vividly present to your five senses, vividly present to your body, vividly present to your experience. If, on the other hand, you find that you're in a hazy dream zone, then it's very important to come back to your senses. Your body is a beautiful tool to anchor consciousness in a deeper sense of reality. Awareness is not trying to change things, awareness is not trying to fixing anything. You can start to notice that there is this presence of awareness within you, which is not trying to change your humanness. It's not trying to alter you. Just as important, it's not trying to alter others. This awareness is totally inclusive. It is a state of being where everything is okay simply the way it is. Enlightenment is nothing more than the complete absence of resistance to what is. If we ask, who am I without the me concept? What am I without the me? Instantly the wordless can open up, the conceptless can open up. Allow the experience of that, because that is the living answer to the questions. What am I? Who am I? This is not the dead conceptual answer, but the living answer. It is alive. In this moment of radiant awakeness there's a mystery unfolding unto itself, moment to moment to moment. This living state of being, call it what you will, is the only thing that you always have been, always will be, and are right now. You are not a human being, you are being appearing as human.